that's uh, certainly an appropriate way to start the service on Memorial Day weekend. Um, so I want to welcome everybody here this Memorial Day. And I know um, many of you, like me, have probably have several names that come up uh, in your mind this weekend every year. So um, let's just keep those, those in mind as we uh, come this morning to worship God and to uh, thank him for the many blessings that he's given us. So if you could please rise, I'm going to read from Psalm 16 for the call to worship, and then we will start with singing America the Beautiful after that. Psalm 16, starting with verse 5. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in place, pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Let's sing America the Beautiful.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the chance today to gather and to worship you and to thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Father, we thank you for the men and women who have sacrificed everything in order to give us that freedom to allow us to do this. Father, I ask that you be with those families today that might have names that they remember this time of year, maybe more than other times. And Father, I just ask that you uh, wrap your arms around them and comfort them as we lift them up. Father, please be with the men who give the meditations today and Kevin as he brings us your message. And it's in Jesus' precious name that I pray. Amen. You can be seated. And we will go right into Hallelujah for the Cross as we take this time every week to remember the sacrifice that Jesus gave for us on the cross.
Good morning. School year has ended for me and for a lot of students. I know not everyone is quite done yet. But one thing that stayed the same for me in this year that had so much change was senioritis. <laughs> students got it real bad this year. <laughs> they let their work from the first three quarters of the year really carry them through at the end. I think I had a lot of students lose their focus and drive as the end came in sight. It's at this time of communion, I'm thankful that Jesus did not have a case of senioritis. He did not let his work from earlier carry him through the end. It was not enough that he was born or that he was teaching. He had to go to the cross. Not only did he go to the cross for us, but also he was raised three days later. Uh, Luke 24, 1 through 8. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Death was not even the end of his work. He's in heaven right now, working right now for us. He's preparing a place for us to go. He is interceding for us, and he's waiting to come back again. We focus our remembrance at this time on the sacrifice that Jesus was. We eat the bread to remember his beaten body, drink the juice to remember his spilt blood. We remember that he offered himself for us as a gift. We need to accept his gift of grace and we need to remember that our job doesn't end with that acceptance of that gift. We need to go out and share the good news with all we come in contact with. We can't get a case of senioritis now. We still have work to do to show our saviors to other. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to this communion, gather around this table to remember your sacrifice for us, we thank you that you willingly went to the cross for us to take our sin upon yourselves so that through this gift of grace you have provided, we have an opportunity to be in heaven with you. And we remember at this time, too, that we want to bring as many people to you as possible to share in this meal around this table at this time. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So this is the part of the service that we always... Uh, reflect on the the gift that God gave us and then how we can um, I, I guess we could never pay him back but <laughs> at least give back a portion of what he's blessed us with um, so for our offering him this morning we're going to sing living hope if you could please rise Thank you. 
baseball here. I don't know if you noticed, but I stopped playing for about a page and a half. And that's because my pedal that turns the pages on my iPad went about six pages ahead. And so I started going back and it went back like two and then it went six pages that way. So, and then I had to figure out what page we were on. So apologize for that. Technology. Good morning. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. These words from God to Joshua are recorded in Joshua 1, verse 9. Moses has just died, and Joshua is being installed by God as the leader of the Israelites as they're preparing to cross the Jordan into the Promised Land. It's a very exciting time, and I imagine for Joshua, it's a time of uncertainty and perhaps some fear. God's encouragement is right on time. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. These words also offer encouragement today to military members maybe heading out on a mission or to police officers responding to another domestic violence call or to firefighters donning their protective gear about to enter a burning building. It's most certainly offered encouragement to those that we remember this weekend who never came home from battle. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. These words also offer encouragement to us in our daily lives. Perhaps you're thinking about taking a mission trip. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Maybe you want to be able to witness to a coworker but don't know how to start. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Perhaps you're pondering out a step in faith with your tithing. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. No matter your circumstance, God's encouragement is right on time. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us in this congregation. Father, I just ask that you Bless the giver, bless these donations, bless these tithes as they go out and uh, do work for your kingdom. Father, it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Good morning. We are going to spend a few months now being in prayer again, remembering uh, those who have given their lives, remembering um, our nation, uh, our freedoms, uh, the needs, the concerns, the issues. Um, Friends and loved ones, this is a request for Jim Matthews, who is a friend of the Harveys. Uh, we mentioned him earlier. He had a massive stroke, which caused him to fall, and he is now in critical care unit at Grant. 
So we appreciate your prayers for Jim Matthews and for his family. Uh, I don't know if anybody in the room has any others to share online or offer. We will encourage you to take a few moments. Let's just be all of us praying, personally praying silently, then I'll close. Our Heavenly Father, today we remember sacrifice. We remember those who have bravely fought and given their lives. We are reminded of the gift of life that was provided uh, through the death and the resurrection of our Lord. We are mindful of what awaits in eternity and of our opportunities to respond to your truth, uh, to be uh, accepting of Jesus as Lord and Savior. Father, thank you for what your word teaches us every day about every aspect of life, about uh, coming to you, about growing in faith, about marriage and parenting and work and finances. Father, we know that whatever our concern, whatever the burden of our heart today, you are able, uh, you hear, you understand, you are, you are working and moving even when we can't see it, even when it hurts. Uh, Father, we pray that we would continue to have that trust, uh, the willingness to move forward in faith. Thank you for those missionary families who are doing just that around the world, even as we speak. We pray that your presence, uh, your comfort, your strength, and your leading would be upon them and us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All, all I said was, she has her arm extended like that, straight out, every time. That's all I said. It was a very simple comment that I made on the sidelines of our championship soccer game last Sunday. I know the game. Okay? I know that a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder charge in soccer is, is legal. But this player wasn't stopping at that. She would come in with her shoulder. She would go in with her elbow and push off every single time. I thought it had gone on for too long. I'm going to give you a sample image of what our girls have to encounter a lot of times on the field. Okay, we're the green team, the little tiny one, okay, playing the giant purple team. Um, now, that is an extreme, to be fair. That's our shortest player against one of their tallest. But nevertheless... We coaches have to look out for our little green players. Okay? Now, I did not say, hey, ref. I did not call him a blind fool or stupid or anything like that. But he knew I was conversing with him. I rebuked him because he needed it. I thought this was a textbook example of our subject matter at hand today because rebuke as a verb is this, express sharp disapproval or criticism of someone because of their behavior or actions. That's all I did. Or so I thought. Well, he whipped around. Okay, this official. <laughs> that's not us, but that's just the picture. You know. And I don't, I, to be honest, I don't even know if play continued in the game or not. And the official doesn't know if play continued in the game or not because he was turned around and screaming at Craig. Well, who said that? And Craig, head coach, goes, I don't know. You know. And I'm sure Craig was thinking it's probably one of our very emotional fathers who's over on the sideline getting excited. And the referee was getting on Craig. You've got to control it. So I walked down there and said, I said it. <laughs> to which I'm sure Craig went, oh, great. You know? <laughs> it wasn't a father. It was a coach. Not only was it a coach, it was one just preached me a sermon like six hours ago. <laughs> You know? So we had, referee and I had a little conversation, and the game continued. No further dust-ups, no, no more problems. Um, now, I will add that that very same player was ejected from the game not five minutes later. I thought that was God just saying, you, I was right. That's what, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, and, and after the game, I'm walking out with Denise. I said, was I wrong in what I said? <laughs> she went, well, what you, it wasn't what you said. It was how you said it. So we need to work on your intonation. And, and apparently I had let this official believe that I wanted to 
run out there on the field and stab him in the back of the neck with a screwdriver. I don't know. It's just, it must have been how it, it sounded to him. So I know I need to listen to Nathan this morning here in 2 Samuel chapter 12. I know it. Okay, now, now there is a place for all of us to be God's voice. I, I hope we don't like relish this idea of rebuking. I hope you're not anxious to put this on your resume as a bullet point. You know, I'm a great rebuker, and my fellow employees will just love it. You know, um, that this is not for Indeed or LinkedIn or Handshake or Craigslist. You know, that's, that's not where this goes. And my hope this morning is that all of us will accept that there are times in life when we're going to fall on both sides of this conversation. Sometimes I am the rebuker. And sometimes I need to be the rebukey, if those are words. So for the first side, when, when I am the one who is giving the rebuke, and we're continuing in this weekly look at David's life, and the fallout from his adulterous night with Bathsheba continues, and uh, the prophet Nathan, friend of David's, is, is tapped. He is the rebuker. In this chapter, this is the first sentence of 2 Samuel 12. The Lord sent Nathan to David. I don't know about you, but if I'm Nathan, I'm not real, real eager to have this conversation. The wife asks, what, what's, what's on your agenda today, honey? Oh, I have to go call out the king regarding his recent affair. No, oh, well, have a good day. <laughs> Where's the life insurance policy? And, and, and there's, there's not a lot of room in here for Nathan to avoid the conversation. The Lord sent him. Uh, Jonah tried to avoid being sent. That didn't work out so well for him. Nathan goes. He does what needs done here. He goes and tells the most powerful man in the nation what that man is unwilling to tell himself. And he does it very well. So I want to listen to Nathan's rebuke of David and, and see what we can learn actually from both men here in this situation. 2 Samuel 12, 1, the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children, shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing, had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah and if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. As rebukes go, this is an excellent example. Why is that? And the first thing is truth. That is key. Absolute truth. If, if I find myself, if you have to go rebuke somebody, don't go on hearsay. Get the facts. Know the truth. I'm on the sidelines when I'm coaching. I watch these soccer games very intently. I knew exactly what the one player was doing. I know the rules. What I shared with that official was true. So what, what is your source? Is this firsthand, I know this to be fact? Is this gossip? I trust we all know this, but for the record, just because you read something online on the Internet doesn't automatically mean it's true. Right? Speak truth. We say God's truth, which is synonymous with the truth. We live in this culture, the day, the age, where everybody wants to redefine truth. They all say that's your truth. 
You say, well, it's mine, but more importantly, it's God's truth. It's biblical truth. This is Jesus in John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No. There isn't any situation where we need to rebuke somebody that we cannot find what we need in the scripture. Uh, sex, money, marriage, parenting, finances, attitude, authority. It, it's all covered in here. When, if I go to rebuke somebody, I do that first with scriptural truth. Nathan is very clearly speaking for God, and David is aware of that, and this helps. David's awareness, David's acceptance of God and his truth is what makes this rebuke work. We'll look at David briefly at the end, uh, but, but Nathan uses a story really well, disarms David emotionally, defensively. He's able to hear this. He's objectively able to hear the truth, and, the, and this is true. The consequences still remain. That's part of the truth. You say, well, is mercy available? Yes, that's true. Can grace be poured out on somebody? Yes, that's true. But also true is there are still going to be consequences of your choice. Do not be deceived, Galatians 6, 7. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And we, we'll move on, but, but there's a lot that can help make a rebuke more effective. But it has to start with this. I speak biblical truth. Next is timing, and I, I haven't found anybody that had like a definitive time stamp on how long after that night Nathan comes to David. Uh, some Old Testament scholars think it could have been up to a year. It may have been 12 months that pass before Nathan pays this visit. However long it has been, God has now determined that the timing is right. Having good timing is very helpful in a successful rebuke. And I understand you can't always wait 12 months. You know, what if I'd just chosen to wait six days to talk to the official? <laughs> Call him up. Hey, you remember that game we had a week ago? You know, I think this, you should have, it's too late. Can't go replay the game. Uh, David, this is an earlier situation, but some will remember David has already previously been rebuked or cautioned, um, <clears throat> confronted by Abigail in 1 Samuel 25. If you remember that account, David and his men, he has hundreds of men, and they've been out living in the, in the wilds, on the run from Saul, and they have become like a de facto protective wall, security force for the locals, for their shepherds and their sheep, and they make sure nothing happens to them. It's customary, it's typical in their culture. And in time of shearing, kind of festival celebration, David sends a few guys to Nabal, he's the man who owns all the sheep, and says, hey, could you give us anything? Kind of as a you know, token of appreciation. Whatever you can spare. And Nabal <laughs> says, absolutely not. I don't know who David is. Why am I, I'm not going to share any of my food. Why? I don't know who this guy is, where he comes from. No way. And so David's men go back and give the, the bad news. And what, what's David's response? Gentlemen, strap on your swords. We're going to go pay Nabal a visit. About 400 of the group saddle up, come charging in. In the meantime, Nabal's servants have gone to now his wife, Abigail, and said, <laughs> guess what your husband just did? And the text says that she wasted no time. She lost no time. Abigail immediately says, get some food, get some drinks. She hops on her donkey, takes off, confronts, meets David head on as he's rushing in in this emotion and anger. And she, she says, let, let me talk to you. No. And she, timing is critical there. To Nabal and others, that's how they survive the day, because she knows it's important. Sometimes, sometimes a rebuke of a parent, child, spouse, neighbor, employee, sometimes it has to be immediate. I get that. Other times it might be, do I have a window of opportunity here? Can I pray, think? Timing matters. 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience. Careful instruction. How many people do you know have been confronted at the wrong time and are, as a result they're just driven more deeply into it? Timing is essential. A thoughtless Christian can go off in a hurry and it just makes it worse. Do, maybe you have a situation you're thinking, does everybody else in the room need to hear this? Can this not wait until we get home. I'm cautioning you again, that church foyer is not the best place to rebuke your loved one. Sound echoes in there like you wouldn't believe. There are a lot of people going to hear that that don't need to hear that. I'm going to, I'm going to rebuke my kid in the car seat on the way home. It's a perfect time. You got a whole car full of their friends. Are they just going to remember that? 
and drag it out in front of your kid time and time again? Timing matters. Tactics is one. Tactics matter. Um, Under tactics, I'm putting delivery. Delivery and courage. But we'll start with delivery. Nathan's delivery here is exemplary. Right? Apparently, mine last Sunday at the soccer game was not. Uh, Denise was on the sideline, sitting in her chair, and she hears it. Right? She goes, oh boy, here we go. Mark Kaiser was at the game. He heard it. First game he came to. That's good. Uh, <laughs> Ethan Eckert was on the sideline. He heard it. Sarah heard it. Ian heard it. Ava heard it. Ava came up to me in the middle of the game. She says, man, I've been on this team with you for six years. I've never heard you that loud. Apparently, people in the plane over our head heard it. I don't. <laughs> um, my, my delivery shot down any chance of my rebuke being received well initially. You know? Now, I will debate the success of that. And one of the coaches said, I think you got your point across, but that's because the point was true, okay? not because it was well delivered. But there's no questioning this. There's no questioning Nathan, i.e. God's brilliance here. How do you confront, in this case, the most powerful man, but I think it's any man, any woman, any child, any, how do you, the secret is to get them to confront themselves. And if you notice in there very carefully, Nathan doesn't even have to ask the question. There's no place in there where he says, hey, David, what do you think I should do? He doesn't even get that far. David just volunteers. He just blurts it out. This guy deserves to die which is an overstep of the law, because David knows the law. That's Exodus 22.1, the four-time restitution. That's what's required. But David's going, well, that's not enough. That's not sufficient. This guy deserves to die. In his mind, it's not severe enough. Because of that, see this approach? Because of the story approach, David is disarmed. He's defenseless. I like this quote. Somebody said, Nathan's sword is within an inch of David's neck before David even knows that Nathan has a sword. So if I feel the need to confront, and and there might be a need, delivery matters. The right words, the right time, the right tone, posture, intensity. Nathan doesn't just walk up here and poke his finger in David's chest. You're a sinner. I'm ashamed of you. Proverbs 25, 11. A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Like an earring of gold or an ornament of fine gold is a wise man's rebuke to a listening ear. And that is exactly what Nathan has at this point, a listening ear. And I want to use the best words possible, but God's words are always the best. I, if I go up to somebody and say, I am ashamed, that's going to be construed as what? So you think you're better than me. You, think you're per- you never make a mistake. If I could lead with, how does this honor God? If you have to, God is ashamed. Take me as a rebuker. Take me out of the equation. This is really between you and God. How does what you're doing here line up with what God's truth says? 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. These are the wisest words right here. And I, ha- and I have to have courage. I have to add courage to the delivery. That's an important tactic. Have you ever been caught up in this? You're thinking to yourself how you would rebuke somebody. You've even said it out loud to yourself. Well, I'm going to tell them that. And you, then you'd go tell it to the spouse. Next time I see them, I'm going to. To which uh, the wife will say, okay, you're going to go tell them now? No. <laughs> Not really going to actually tell them. I, I get that here. Who is David? He is the king. He has total unquestioned, absolute control. Nathan is courageous. I, I read a, an author says, it's hard. Don't fear the loss of the friendship. God honors the truth. It's truth. It's only truth that's going to set people free. And, and one of the preachers shared this story. A father came to me some time ago and spelled out the tragic story of his own son. He described one rebellious act after another being committed by a son. I finally had to level with the man and said, look, You're lowering your standard to stay away from the pain of confrontation. This boy is ruining and ruling your home. He's out of control. He's lost respect for his mom and dad. He's not going to say that from his own lips. But you have to confront him. Tell him the truth. Stand your ground. He said, I use this story from chapter 12. The man took my words to heart. He thought through his wording. He waited for the right time. And I'm happy to say he firmly confronted a teenage son who, story says, responded beautifully. Tough task, 
but worth the effort. Tough love pays off. <clears throat> and he said, and I concur with this, my hat goes off to any parent who stands that ground. And if you happen to be one of them, it says, you will go down in history as those quiet, silent heroes for whom God has reserved special rewards because we're living in a day of great compromise, especially in the realm of the home. We learned this lesson of confrontation from Nathan. The eras pass. The styles and lifestyles change. God's standard has not changed. Still holy, still pure. He honors the truth, even if it's tough to share. But that's what he requires of us. If I really care, I care enough to confront. So, so I'm winding down. That's, you know, spend a majority of our sign as the rebuker. But if God has called you to be the messenger, do it. Do it skillfully. Do it humbly. Do it right or don't do it. If God calls me to confront, I have to confront. People are still longing for that. They will listen to the word of God. If you encounter somebody who has willfully stepped into the wrong path, I face it. We call it what it is. Right time, right way, all of that. Don't hedge it. Don't skip it. Don't try to redefine it. Don't explain it away. Sin is sin. And by verse 14, at this point, Nathan is done speaking. And he turns around. He walks out. The door closes, and David is left by himself. That's the other side. You know, when I am the one who is receiving the, the rebuke. <clears throat> the author said, you have a blind spot. If you don't think you have one, that's why we call it a blind spot. Because you don't see it. And somebody else sees it, and they have to tell you about it. And it has to be dragged out into the light. It has to be exposed and extracted and obliterated. Why doesn't Nathan just do up and poke him in the chest on the spot? Why does he take this long story, which is kind of they call it like a side tackle? Because David's going to confront himself. He has to get, unwind the self-righteousness. Is this true of you? We each have a nearly impenetrable fortress of resistance when we're called out on our wrongs. And it keeps us blind to our blindness. So if, probably when, I find myself as a rebuke E, can I cultivate a sense of gratitude, at least eventually? This whole, this whole process isn't fun for either party. Okay. The initial reaction is probably going to be defensive. But can I get through that and move to being grateful? If, if somebody's letting you have it, be grateful that God loves you enough and they love you enough to say it. And I know how hard that is in the moment, but can I remember it later? Revelation 3.19 says this, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. And, and I think David's going to take some, it's going to need some time to process this conversation, if you will. But in the end, I believe that he is glad that they had this talk. In that earlier moment with Abigail, when, when you know, she stops David from vengefully killing Nabal. And a side note on Abigail and Nabal, they don't have the greatest of marriage at all, if you know that. You know, his name literally means fool, and she knows it. And I'm sure when the message first came to her, she could have rolled over in her bed and said, hey, David's going to give me a new lease on life by the end of the day. But she doesn't. And she goes and she gets the fool's life spared. And David says to Abigail in 1 Samuel 25, 32, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And he's grateful for what happens. And, and in God's timing, if you, understand, you know that account, God will move Within 10 days, Nabal will die of God's hand, and grateful will again be grateful. David will be. You know? And I, I don't, when I'm looking at David and Nathan, I don't know that there's tons of interaction all the time between these two guys, but I think David winds up grateful that Nathan loved him this much. Have you, have you ever been to the doctor? You know what's going to happen. <laughs> you got an infection, or you know you're going, they're going to stab you with something. I don't have, you know, it's, they're going to have to be a shot. There's going to have to be a land. I like this. I like this description, even though it's kind of graphic. Although I knew it was coming and dreaded the thought, when the doctor lanced it, I literally felt a gush of relief as the infection poured out. Suddenly, there was even a relief of the pain. Though the lancing was painful, the relief eclipsed it. And, and if you've ever been in this setting and been rebuked, I'd say, I'm glad they cared. Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. A man named J.S. Park had to rebuke his friend 
and he said this, we know it's true, even in the best of friendships, rebuke is uncomfortable and icky and awkward. And if you get to that place of honesty, there will be a place of tension where the friendship hangs in the balance. So he went to his friend and he rebuked him and he said, after I was done, I braced myself. He said, I physically reeled back waiting for the shouting match. My friend said, thank you, stood up, not another word, went to the door and he left. He said, man, for some reason I felt, felt like that was worse. He said, I couldn't sleep that night. I knew I'd totally screwed this up. <clears throat> Friendship was ruined. Years of, <clears throat> excuse me, years of loyalty are over. He said, I kept going over and over in my head to figure out what were the wrong words and how I could have said it better. And the next day my friend came and he sat down and we sat in the same chairs in the same place. And he said, I thought about what you said and you're right. And I'm going to stop immediately. <laughs> Park said, my whole body unclenched. Said, to be truthful, I almost cried. And he said, I can't remember a time when it happened that quickly, so graciously. He stuck to his word. He stopped. He went out of his way to let it never happen again. He said, I never played around with it. <clears throat> I didn't give him a bunch of I told you so's. Aren't you glad you listened to me? Told you I was right. If anything, we grew closer. I was a groomsman in his wedding. He was a groomsman in mine. If, if you have that level, that degree of a relationship anywhere in your circle, be grateful that you have that level of love. Be grateful and, and be willing to repent. Re repent biblically. I, I've just been rebuked. True repentance. <clears throat> Confession, admission, humility. That's part of just, I just, gotta, I just admit it. Confess it. David, the words are very short in verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And notice the absence of any other words. No excuses, no explanations. I have sinned. A contrite heart makes no demands and has no expectations. Truly repenting. I want to change course. Turn around, the 180, different direction. Well, I'm going to make a break with what I've been doing and, and go this way. I don't know if you can feel this. Don't raise your hand. Yeah, I've rebuked him or her hundreds of times. Hundreds. We just keep going right back. It doesn't change for very long. <clears throat> I... I I'm telling you, I want to have fewer outbursts with the officials. I do. I'm glad Ava's only heard one in five or six years, but hopefully we can make it further for the next one. Don't you laugh. You know, <laughs> and, and the last one, true repentance. I'm going to claim God's forgiveness, and I'm going to be reinstated. Forgiveness and reinstatement. And I think a lot of people only go half on this. There's a lot of rebukees, and, and we understand forgiveness but they don't get reinstated. They don't want to get back in the game. They don't get, there are some people you just want to look at and say, stop living mired in the guilt. Get on with it. The person who rebuked you wants to see you do better. God certainly wants to see you do better. He's willing to work with you. Move forward. That's what James said in 122. Anybody who listens to the word, including forgiveness, but doesn't do what it says... It's like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and forgiveness and grace and all of that and continues to do this, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in way that. That's the truth of God. Be grateful that somebody cared enough, heed the correction, change course, get, get back out there. You know? if, if you have been rebuked, don't forget... What you heard about forgiveness, that's, that's why Jesus went to the cross. Not just to point out our sins, but to forgive us of our sins. And the very next words from Nathan, 13b, the Lord has taken away your sin, you're not going to die. That, there's, there's no better healing words you can hear. The Lord has taken away your sins. Well, I admit to you that I was yelling a week ago on the sideline. I was very grateful then three days later when I ambled up to that same group of girls and Craig is the coach. We were watching some younger siblings and encouraging them in their rec league game. I was grateful that, that Craig didn't look at me and go, move away from us, you referee abuser. You, know? you are no longer a part of our group. You know? so, so, sometimes one of the hardest things for the rebuke 
skis <laughs> is to get back in the game. I, I kept thinking, I don't know what, that's the boat captain in it in Top Gun telling Maverick, engage. You know, you got to get back in there. And I don't, I'll give you an exercise to, to finish for, for the rebuke ease. If this is hard for you, say, man, it's just hard for me to accept forgiveness, write it on your bathroom mirror. You can write it in steam, shaving cream, soap, Sharpie, I don't care. You know, just write it on the mirror so that when you see your face in the morning, you are reminded that you are forgiven. Keep remembering. Sometimes we need to give a rebuke. Sometimes I need to receive one. I don't relish either time. But, but when the truth of the word of God needs to be shared, I have to be willing to say it. And be willing to hear it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that uh, others have lived uh, their lives in your mercy and grace, and we're thankful that their successes and failures have been recorded for our education. And we pray that we would continue to be willing to listen, to heed, uh, to apply, to engage. Father, we just ask that you would remind us over and over again of the value of our relationship with you and our relationships with each other. Uh, we know that it is a, a huge task uh, to come to this place where we can share and rebuke in love and graciousness, but we pray that we would not shrink back from that obligation. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. <clears throat> and we always come to this point as the worship team comes to the front. We will encourage, we will challenge, we will invite you if you know that you need to, to make that decision and to uh, accept Jesus Christ, then this is your invitation. Let's all stand together as we sing. <clears throat> you can stay and study with us today. I know even more Sunday school classes are picking up and re-engaging. Next Sunday will be June the 6th, so we just hope that we can just keep taking those steps back to everybody being able to be back and, and stay for class and youth groups. And it has been a, a blessing for me already in these first two weeks to share with Tori and Ethan in the office day to day. Um, if you have questions on the, the women's work or there's an invitation out there, a sign up for the food and fellowship event for Saturday the 26th. You can check with Tori. Ethan is with his family right now. Cherish and Ethan are on vacation for Memorial Day, but Derek has information for to lead the youth today. And they also have a sign-up sheet. You guys are going to start having a weekly 
lunch and barbecue and there'll be a theme and an invitation to, to make your own side dish, et cetera. So those are out there in the foyer for you. I know we want to have a vacation Bible school meeting two weeks from today, the 13th at 1130. I Volunteer needs out there, and the okay. also vacation Bible school. There's still sign-up sheets. Okay, sign-ups for volunteers. And if you're in the list of people who volunteer or been recruited for drama, I would like to talk to you. Okay, <laughs> okay, drama for vacation. Vacation Bible school Monday through Friday, July 19th. It's the first night that it starts, and we'll have meals here for the staff and a time of devotions and prayer. That everything will be quick. The summer will go too quickly for me, so just try to keep up on those. Or anything else? That, yes, ma'am. Um, our generational small group is starting on Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Ladies, um, I encourage you, sixth grade and up, um, everyone is welcome. Um, hopefully, we'll get to grow and actually start to meet in some houses. But for now, it'll be 6 p.m. on Tuesday, um, and everyone's welcome. So. Pray with me, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again so much for this this time that we've had to, to gather and to worship you and to hear your message. Father, I just ask that uh, you be with those who attended, be with those that couldn't make it today. And Father, just um, be with those families this weekend that are just, that are um, perhaps hurting a little bit, um, remembering uh, those that didn't come back. And Father, I just ask that you keep us safe, bring us back uh, next time. If it's in your will, it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. <laughs>